Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi there. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks again to Austin Edge for the music in the waiting room. That was some ambient music from our friend Austin Edge. Welcome to Fire and Flowers, a story of resistance. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Evan Holmstrom, and I'm a program coordinator at North Cascades Institute. As we begin our gathering this evening, we acknowledge that we are each attending remotely from the homelands of many different tribal nations. I myself am currently on the ancestral homeland of the Nooksack, the Swinomish, the Lummi tribes, and additionally federally recognized and unrecognized indigenous peoples. We pay respect to these people past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and to all indigenous peoples. To acknowledge the land is to recognize its longer history and recognize our place in that history. It is to recognize these lands and waters and their significance for the peoples who lived and continue to live in this region, whose ways of life and spiritual practices were and are tied to the land and to the water, and whose lives continue to enrich and develop in relation to the land, the water, and other inhabitants today. Again, my name is Evan, Program Coordinator, and you're here for North Cascades Institute virtual program. North Cascades Institute's mission is to inspire environmental stewardship through transformative learning experiences in nature, or in this case, your own homes. Please do know that we're working on transitioning back to in-person events as they become feasible and safe. Um, and a quick note on tonight's program, um, while there are many actual wildfires burning right now, um, up and down the Pacific coast. Um, we acknowledge that these wildfires are significant source of distress and doing real damage to friends and neighbors that we probably know. So we scheduled this program to happen um, before those blazes really blew up. Um, and we just wanna say that our hearts go out to those affected by the current blazes. And next is to introduce this evening's instructor, Mari Schramm. Uh, Mari Schramm is a storehouse of local knowledge, a scientific and compassionate thinker, and a ball of inexhaustible spunk. She hails from the Chelan area on the east side of the Cascades, where she has observed since an early age how wildfires behave and interact with plant and human communities. She studied biology with a specific focus on fire ecology in the Cascade Mountains. Five years doing research on post fire vegetation recovery with the United States Forest Service then pivoted and spent the past three and a half years at the Environmental Learning Center with us, working as an instructor and a coordinator for Mountain School and Family Getaways. I'm very excited to be presenting Mari tonight because she and I have worked closely for a long time and she's a great colleague and a great friend. She's very excited to be here tonight to share with us how ecology and wildfire come together. So without further ado, here she is everybody. Thank you so much, Evan. I appreciate it. Um, and welcome, everyone. Evan, let me know when I can start sharing my screen here, when I can start with. Go ahead and share that screen. Oh, great. Um, let's see, come on. Give me a moment. I'll share it. All right. Cool. Well, well, thank you everyone for being here. I know that um, there's a lot going on right now and I, I really appreciate you all coming to learn about this with me. Um, and thank you, Evan, for doing that land acknowledgement at the beginning here too. I'm currently at our Environmental Learning Center. So I'm on the traditional homeland of um, the Upper Skagit as well as the Inkakatma, the Swinomish and the Fox Seattle. And I'll talk a little bit about their, their presence in history with um, fire in this valley. But before we get started, um, I, wanna, <laughs> I would just wanna say that like, this, this is a new experience for all of us. This is a new experience for me as an instructor. Um, and I don't know a whole lot about what you all know about fire. And that's been really difficult for me when I'm planning this. So I kind of wanna start with um, a poll. Evan, can you still run that poll from where you are? I'll have that poll for you in just a moment, Mari. Cool. I want to start with a poll just to see 
Um, yeah, what, what your understanding is of fire ecology and get a general understanding of, of where we're all at before we dive into this. So take a moment, it's, it's anonymous, so you'll, nobody will know what you said. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, this is this is helpful. Um, this is great. It seems like we're all more or less on the same page where we're at the early stages of understanding um, fire ecology and fire science and some intermediate stages too. That's great. Um, that gives me information on what I should be talking about. And please, like, there's going to be a lot of information in, in here. I'm going to try to keep it as engaging as possible. Um, it's, it's hard to do this virtually. I'm used to having you in front of me. But um, as we're working through it, if you, um, if you have a question, please feel free to jot it down, write it in the chat box, um, and I'll try to come back to it at the end. Great. Thank you. Oh, I can share results. Ooh. Great. Okay. Now, when I first was invited to do this, I was really excited. I love teaching about fire ecology. And I actually had a lesson um, already written that, that was mostly for fifth graders. And I was like, great, I'll just adapt this lesson. It's going to be awesome. And then a week and a half ago, um, like hundreds of thousands of other people across the country, my parents evacuated from our childhood home back in Chelan because of the wildfires. And, um, you know, smoke descended on the West Coast. And it just got a lot more real again for everyone. Um, so I decided like, oh man, I need to add this other thing. I need to add all of this more information. And my presentation got to be massive and long and, and probably more than you could get through in a, in, in a college semester. Unfortunately, we only have an hour here, so I'm going to do my best. But I want to acknowledge that like many things in the world right now, the science is important and it doesn't capture the whole of the human experience behind wildfire. There's a lot that we can't cover here about the way that fire impacts communities and, um, and humans. And th there's just a lot that goes into um, wildfires and, and how they impact our world. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the science mostly here because I think that it's really interesting and it's something that's helped me come to terms with wildfire in my life too. So as we're talking through the science, um, I want you to keep in mind that this, this is an interesting lens to use almost like a metaphor um, in some ways to how fire impacts us um, as humans and in human communities too. So I'm going to talk mostly about the science, but I encourage you to be thinking broader than that um, while we're talking through it and maybe later as you're reflecting too. So that's my little disclaimer before we get started. Now, um, I want to start with a bit of a word cloud. So this may or may not work. If you don't want to try it because you don't want to mess anything up, that's okay. <laughs> But what I, want to, what I want to do is have everyone take a minute or two and reflect on an experience that you have had personally with fire. So maybe you um, have been evacuated or lost a home to a fire yourself. Maybe you have friends or family who have. Maybe you've been experiencing the smoke. Um, maybe it's a news story that you've seen. Um, what is a way that you have been impacted by fire? I want you to take a couple minutes just to reflect on that. If you have a piece of paper, you want to jot down some notes, great. If you're sitting there with someone else, you want to talk about it, great. Um, I'll just give you a minute or two of silence to think about that.
And now what I want you to do, you'll have a little more time, but I want you to pick out a word or a phrase from that reflection that, um, that stands out to you. And I, I want us to go to this link. So it looks like someone actually entered it in the chat box as well. So I want you to, to go to this link and um, enter in that word or phrase. And you've got a couple, uh, a, a couple different boxes. So you can enter in a couple if you'd like. And what we're gonna try to do here is create like a word cloud um, and, and see what general reactions people have to fire and their experience with fire. So we're gonna try this out. We'll see, it's a new computer skill. All right. Now, maybe you were able to do that. Maybe um, you decided to just do the reflection on your own. Either way, that's fine. Um, I think Kim's going to try to create that word cloud for us, I believe, and get it, get it to us. If it's not working for you, um, what I'll have you do is just enter. Oh, there we go. All right. So I think everyone can, can see this word cloud at least a bit here. And as I'm reading through it, okay, great. Thank you for entering stuff in the chat box too. As I'm reading through this, I'm seeing, um, yeah, it looks like a lot of people enter the word smoke, scary, fear, powerful. Um, and uh, some other more positive terms in here too, right, renewal. Um, Natural cycle, resilience. Um, see, I can't quite see it all here. Yeah, hope, awe, uh, rebirth. Holden, oh great, well, we've actually got some pictures around Holden. <laughs> uh, yeah, so as we can see from this and from your own probably reflective experience, fire is a very complicated topic. It brings up a lot of emotion for us. Um, and, oh, sorry, I, it looks like other people were not able to see that. I read some of them out for you. In general, we, we have a, oh, okay. <laughs> it's a fun experiment for all of us. All right. Susie, can you see that now? Okay, great, perfect. It looks like the word cloud is visible, at least to some folks. So a lot goes into fire, um, and I wanna acknowledge that before we go in. So um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here again, and we'll start through our PowerPoint. Um, and, and as we're going through, if you need to take a minute and step away, if you need to take a minute and um, take care of your own needs, please feel free to do that. Here we go. It's gonna work. It's gonna happen. We're gonna start rolling very soon. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, okay. So over the course of this next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about some wildland fire behavior. We'll talk about the role of fire in the landscape and ecology of the North Cascades Mountains, especially where we're gonna to try to focus in on this area. We'll work on identifying evidence of fire history in a landscape. I think this is a really cool skill to take away so that when you're on a hike, you can see evidence of fire history where you are. And that just, I think, makes the experience a lot richer. And at the end, we'll talk a bit about the relationship between human communities and wildland fire. Um, especially uh, climate change. We'll talk a lot about climate change there at the end. All right. Um, I'm going to give you just a moment to look at this triangle and see uh, if you can 
if it's something that makes sense to you, maybe you've seen it before, this is kind of the basics of fire. So I want you to take a minute and, and look at that. So, all right, I'm also sharing my video here too, so I, you might be able to see my face. <laughs> um, so this is our basic of fire or basics of, of fire science, right? Fire is basically just um, energy and it's created using, uh, by, in a reaction that uses some sort of fuel, oxygen and heat. It doesn't have to be a spark, but it's usually uh, a spark. So we'll keep that in mind, but I want to zoom out a little bit and talk about um, our fire behavior triangle. So our fire behavior triangle includes weather, topography, and fuel. These are the things that can impact what, the way that fire behaves in a landscape. So um, when we're talking about weather, oftentimes you think about fire weather being really hot, really dry, not a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, right? Um, and high winds. That's what we call like, uh, like a red flag warning, for example. And um, that kind of weather definitely impacts the fire's behavior. Something else that's kind of interesting to talk about here is that fire can sometimes actually create its own weather patterns. So um, this is not an image that I took, um, and, but it's, a, it's an image of, of how fire, when it's burning, right, back from a couple triangles ago, we talked about how fire needs oxygen. Fire will actually use all the oxygen in the atmosphere around it, and it will have to pull in oxygen from farther around the fire. So it creates these pretty high gusts of winds that pull air in towards a fire, if it's a large fire. So these combined with, with wind that's already in the atmosphere can create pretty crazy and unpredictable wind patterns. It can create these like vortices of, of flame, like upside down tornadoes of flame that will shoot trees into the, in front of the fire and just create pretty unpredictable weather conditions. Um, additionally, Fire can create these giant plumes. Maybe you've seen these before. This is from um, the Wolverine fire, actually up near Holden Village in 2015. Um, and when these plumes get large enough, if the atmospheric uh, conditions are, correct, are, are right for it, it can actually create its own lightning storm, which can create other lightning strikes and other fires. Or it can actually create a, a, a rainstorm and put itself out. So fire has some interesting ways that it, it interacts with the atmosphere around it to create its own weather patterns. Another part of this triangle is topography. So fire depends a lot on the topography, the way that the, the slopes are angled and um, the way that they're, the direction that they're facing. This is an image of the Wolverine fire after, um, like the year after it burned. And uh, you can see how topography came into play here. So when a fire burns, similar to if you strike a match and you hold the match upside down, that flame will travel up the match really quickly to your hand. Fire travels uphill. So let's say that the fire started here. Um, it started burning uphill, burning uphill. It got to some point where it caught a log on fire and that log rolled down to the bottom of the hill and started another fire here. So that's one way that fire will use the topography to travel around um, a forest. Another interesting thing um, about the topography is that you often see these features in here that can slow down a fire, like, like alpine fire breaks, basically. So this is a rocky outcropping, and you can tell that the fire was really hot right here, and then it, it kind of chilled out, it kind of slowed down because it couldn't get over that rocky outcropping, and you actually, as a result, have this clump of unburned trees here, which is great, like that's a healthy fire, um, that's healthy fire movement in, a, in an ecosystem. So topography has a lot to do with a fire behavior as well. The last thing to talk about here are fuel. fuels. So fuels um, are basically anything that will burn. Oftentimes we think of this as being um, plants and especially dead and down plants. So the way that fire managers or, or land managers will measure fuels is they'll actually go out into the forest and they'll measure different sizes of fuels. And these are identified by their different, uh, by the amount of time basically it takes that fuel to dry out. So a 10 hour fuel, like this dried up shrub right here, basically a 10 hour fuel will dry up within 10 hours if the atmosphere is hot and dry. Um, so it's gonna dry up pretty quickly and become really flammable. A 100 hour fuel is a little bit thicker, right? Maybe like, I can't remember the exact uh, diameter, but I think it's like one to three inches or something like that. That's gonna dry up more or less within about 100 hours if there's hot dry weather. A 1000 hour fuel is gonna take a little longer, 1000 hours, and you can get up to 10,000 hour fuels too. So 
Um, the reason that this is important is because when a fire is coming through, it needs dry fuel. If a tree is still alive or has a lot of water in it, um, the fire can still burn it, but it has to use its own energy as a fire to um, evaporate all the water out of that fuel before it can burn it. So um, this is, might come back into play when we're talking about climate change too, because we're seeing more evapotranspiration and we're seeing the drying out of living um, plants more than how they used to be in the past. But that's why it's important for, for fuel managers to know what kinds of fuels are out there. So, or, or land managers know what kind of fuels are out there. So if you go out in the forest and you know, like, okay, this slope right here has a whole bunch of 10 hour fuels, but no 1000 hour fuels. So, you know, it's, it's probably gonna burn through that area quickly, um, but it's, it's not gonna spend a lot of time there, right? And conversely, this other area has 10,000 hour fuels, but we know that it rained last week, so it's probably not gonna be a big deal. Um, that is something that's helpful for fire managers to know. Another thing that's interesting in this image is if we look at, um, I think this is a, a Douglas fir here, it has what we call ladder fuels around it. So if a fire comes through here, first of all, there are a lot of fuels, it's probably gonna burn pretty hot, um, but the fire's gonna be able to climb up into the canopy of the trees using this ladder fuel. The trunk of the, the uh, fir itself is not super flammable, but if it's got these ladder fuels, it can climb up into the canopy, and from there, we can start to get a canopy fire. Again, this is not an image that I took. This is a pretty crazy fire. Um, but you can see here that if a fire stays pretty low to the ground, then um, I actually don't know. It looks like this area might have already been burned, but we're going to imagine that this fire <laughs> stayed pretty low to the ground. And when it got to this point, there were a lot of ladder fuels, and that those fuels made the fire climb into the canopy until we get some really extreme heat um, with a lot of tree mortality um, and other things that happen when the fire gets really hot. So we talked a little bit about this first triangle here. We talked a little bit more about our fire behavior triangle here. I'm not gonna go into super a lot of detail, but just know that these triangles can continue as we're moving up um, in scale. There's, there are ways to think about fire as we move up in scale. I do wanna spend a moment just to talk about the ignitions because um, ignitions can be either naturally caused or human caused, um, anthropogenic. And, um, I want to acknowledge that people have been using fire as a management tool in this area for a very long time, for thousands of years. Um, indigenous folks in this area, in fact, the upper Skagit, um, have used controlled burns in the area around concrete um, in, this, in the Skagit Valley to um, encourage the growth of bracken fern, which has uh, edible roots system. So it's, it's a tool that's been used by folks in this area for a long time. So just because a fire is lit by humans doesn't mean it's inherently bad. We're changing the way that, that humans interact with the landscape, so it's a little different now, but know that it's not necessarily like unnatural for humans to cause fires in this area. Um, plants are adapted to it. Speaking of plants, we're going to spend some time talking about vegetation because I love plants and I think they're really fun. <laughs> so vegetation is this other um, component that really impacts a fire regime. And plants have four different strategies to help them adapt to fire. One of the strategies is to re-sprout. We call these sprouters. So um, some plants can, basically the, the above ground biomass of the plant will die when a fire comes through, but the root system will still uh, remain living. So this is an image on the left here of um, the, the Goodell Creek fire down in New Halem that burned in 2015. Um, and we see that this big leaf maple is re-sprouting from the same root bowl. So I don't remember if this tree actually was dead or not, but either way, the fire came through and stimulated that root system to send up a new shoot because, hey, there's a whole bunch of extra nutrients and extra space now that the fire burned out, all this other stuff. This is an image on the east side of um, some aspen. So you can see that original trunk was burned and that root bowl started sending out a whole bunch of new sprouts because it know the, the, the root bowl it knows, I'm anthropomorph anthropomorphizing here, but that root bowl um, has, adapted to know that at this point it can send up a whole bunch more shoots because there's a lot of resources available. Another strategy that plants have is to evade fire. So a lot of plants just say like, you know what, I'm anthropomorphizing here again, but that's okay. Um, a lot of plants are like, you know what, if a fire comes through, um, I'm going to die, but you know what, I'm going to have kids that are going to come back stronger than ever. So they put a bunch of seeds in the seed bank in the soil. Maybe they have those seeds um, in their branches still, in the example of like a, a um, lodgepole pine, they have got those seeds in their cones still that will be released after a fire. 
So lodgepole pine is a great example of this. This is a whole field of um, fireweed. Fireweed's a great evader. Um, after a fire comes through, they're able to just come back like crazy. Um, use those seeds that are in the seed bank and come back like crazy. Another example of a, a good evader is lupin. Um, lupin, the seeds of lupin are actually cued by the, by the heat and the chemical cues of fire to start growing after a fire comes through. So um, evading is one great uh, strategy that plants have to dealing with fire. Avoiding fire is another way that you can deal with fire. Um, this is a western red cedar. They, of course, um, don't grow super well. They've got really thin, sorry, they don't survive very well if, if a fire comes through. They've got very thin bark. Um, you don't see a lot of them on the east side. They like to grow on the west side where it's a little um, wetter. They like to grow in areas that are like riparian areas where the fire's probably gonna, gonna slow down a bit and, and not burn quite so hot. And then the last example of an adaptation are the resistors. So resistors on the east side, a classic resistor is your um, ponderosa pine right here. Um, on the west side, a classic example of your resistor is your Douglas fir. In the alpine, actually, the, the best resistor in the alpine is actually at the larch, which is kind of cool. Um, but these resistors are basically plants that are like, you know what, fire's gonna come through, but I'm gonna continue to survive. In fact, in a lot of places, if you go in like this forest here, um, this is a result of the Carlton Complex fire, I believe. So 2015 again, uh, sorry, 2014, it was 2014. And basically any tree in this area that was still had a little bit of green on it after the fire is gonna survive. Um, they're pretty incredible resistors. And you can see this is an image of a, a Douglas fir that was cut down and you can see how the very outside of the bark was burned, but the rest of the tree was pretty well insulated. So we've been talking a bit about east side versus west side, and I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that the reason that these species are different is because of something we call the orographic effect. The orographic effect is basically you've got this um, air coming in from the ocean that has a lot of moisture in it. As it approaches the Cascade Mountains, it starts to go up in elevation and it starts to lose a lot of its um, moisture in the form of rain because it's getting colder and colder and colder. You get to the top of the mountains and come down the other side, temperatures start to go up and there's not as much incentive to start losing that water. Also, a lot of the water is, the moisture is lost from the air as well. Um, so on the east side, you don't get as much rain. That's um, what, you, what we also call the rain shadow effect. So the orographic effect, you can see it even in this image, how the west side has all the, has way more like green forests and meadows and things like that. And the east side has, a, a, is definitely more arid, um, has more grassland and things like that. You can also see it reflected in the, the fire history of the area. So this, both these maps came from a resource called Cal Topo. If you haven't used that resource, it's great. I love it. It's great for hiking too. But they've got um, a feature that allows you to look at the, the boundaries of fires in the, from the past 20 years. So as you can see here, most of the fires in the last 20 years are on the east side of these mountains. Um, I put in Noka's North Cascades National Park um, is in the middle here. So a, a notable exception here, we, we start to see some fires happening here over on the west side. And, and one of the largest here is the Goodell Creek fire, which we're going to talk about. Um, and it actually occurred pretty close to our campus here and, and caused um, forced the evacuation of everyone here on campus in, in the year 2015. So fire has behaved a little differently between east side and west side ecosystems. Um, um, let's see, okay, I think we're doing all right. <laughs> so on the east side, our historic fire regime is definitely shorter than it is on the west side. However, it varies depending on where you are. So some places on the east side are adapted to have frequent fires and pretty low intensity. So pretty, um, yeah, like not very hot. Um, and because of that, you get these like big diameter ponderosa pines and these grassy open areas. Um, this is a, an area just west of Wenatchee. I think that's Mission Ridge ski area in the background. Um, and what's classic to the east side is that you have a, um, a mosaic of severity. So you'll have some areas that are burned um, pretty severely and other areas that aren't. And this means that there's a lot of resources available and there are still seeds available to be spread in different places. So naturally that's what we have, a mosaic of fire severity in the landscape. Um, currently we are dealing with some slightly different, perhaps not exactly natural um, consequences of colonization in this area, of, of development in this area. Um, those include direct and indirect fire suppression. So for decades, it was the policy of the government to show, and land managers everywhere basically, 
probably with the exception of indigenous folks, um, to suppress all fires. So like the rule was like before 10 a.m. put out all the fires. And as you can imagine, that creates a buildup of fuels in the, in the east side, a, a place where those fuels are generally burned out every couple of years. Um, we also have some indirect fire suppression just by the nature of us being in the landscape, um, irrigating places that used to just be open, open grassy fields, um, putting roads in in forested environments. Um, and obviously, we're also dealing with climate change here. So we'll get to climate change more in the future. But just some interesting things to keep in mind. Our, our current um, situation on the east side does look a little bit different than historically how it has looked. On the west side, our historic fire regime is definitely more infrequent. So like on a century scale. Um, so you don't, you don't get a fire every 20 years. You get a fire every 100, 200, 300 years. And when a fire comes through on the west side, it's what we call stand replacing. So it'll basically kill anything that's there, and those things will have to have to regrow and reestablish, especially things like western red cedar. There are some current things we should take into consideration here. There is direct and, and indirect fire suppression happening on the west side as well. However, if we're thinking that the west side um, naturally is in a like century-long fire regime schedule, we haven't been suppressing fire that long. So we don't really have the issue of fuel buildup like we do on the east side. There is a lot of fuel on the west side. <laughs> there is a lot of fuel on the west side, but it's not, um, it's not like it's, it's unnatural like it is on the east side. We don't have to, to worry about reducing those fuels as much as we do on the east side. Obviously, the west side is also dealing with some climate change issues too. So that's to kind of a general idea of west Cascades versus east Cascades. I do also want to spend just a moment talking about the high elevation areas in the Cascades too, um, because these areas have seen fire too. This is an image taken from um, the top of Desolation Peak. And this place, there's a fire lookout there that was built in the 1930s. And when the fire lookout was built, the area around it had actually just burned. So this area does burn. And um, again, it's an infrequent, at in infrequent intervals, and those are generally stand replacing fires. Um, with climate change, we are also seeing an increased risk of stress in these alpine areas, um, drought, and um, that, that stress can also mean that we get things like um, insect in, infestations and things like that. So some other issues that we're dealing with at, at alpine air levels right now. Okay, so what happens after a fire? After any disturbance, we start to see what's called community succession. So succession is the process that an ecosystem goes through after a disturbance. We're going to talk primarily about secondary succession. Just so you know, there is a, another kind of succession called primary succession that we, we use to talk about areas um, that don't have like any living stuff left in them at all. So like areas where a glacier has just receded and there's nothing in the soil, no organic matter, no bacteria, nothing. Um, after a fire, there is some stuff left in the soil. So we, we call it secondary succession. However, the disturbances can look pretty, pretty variable. So this picture on the left here, this is taken actually that this is that fire that um, forced my, my parents to evacuate. So this is taken just a couple days ago. And as you can see, this fire actually it was pretty healthy. It stayed relatively cool. Um, it didn't even burn all the bunch grass. Like there's still some stuff around here that's going to be able to um, spread its seeds in the future. The trees look great. Um, maybe some bottom branches are a little singed. Maybe they'll lose those branches, but that's healthy for the tree. So this is actually a pretty healthy fire. Um, here on the right, we have an image that I took of the Wolverine Creek fire. This is actually up the 10 Mile Falls um, trail if you're going towards Devore Creek. And this area burned pretty hot. So the trees are all killed, um, and this so this was taken the year after it happened. So you can see there is some um, organic matter that's fallen off of the trees, but immediately after immediately after the fire, there was no organic matter left in the soil at all. When there's no organic matter left in the soil, that makes the soil really hydrophobic. So any raindrops that land on it are not absorbed by the soil, which is an issue for any plants trying to regrow, and it creates a lot of flash flooding and a lot of erosion. So you can see there's a lot of erosion that has happened right in this valley. Another thing that happens to the soil if it gets really hot is that you actually have the nitrogen in the soil, which is a really important um, nutrient for species, especially at high elevations. That nitrogen becomes volatilized and goes into the air. So you don't have any nitrogen for plants to grow either. So that's why it's important to have certain species um, that come back that have specific adaptations to help them put more nitrogen in the soil. So this is an example of like, you can have a really mild severity fire that basically just 
releases those nutrients, doesn't volatize the, the nitrogen, it leaves that nitrogen and that organic matter on the ground. Um, or you can have time, places where um, the fire is really severe and um, the successional process is going to look very different. But either way, you're going to start with a, uh, a lot of flowers, a lot of smaller shrubs for, um, and forbs and grasses and things like that. This is taken from the Carlton Complex fire, I think like two years after the fire. This is kind of late in the summer, so I, I put some pictures of the flowers in full bloom here too, because a lot of these are, are kind of starting to dehiss at the end of the season. Um, but there's a lot of lupin here in this picture. Lupin is a great successional species because it's a pea, and as a pea, it's a, it's a nitrogen fixer. So as a nitrogen fixer, it, that means that it's able to, it has a, a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that are in the roots um, to that help fix, take nitrogen from the air and fix it into a form that the plant can use to grow and survive. Um, so that nitrogen gets into the leaves, those leaves die and fall, decompose, and we have nitrogen in the soil again, which is really important for the successional process of a forest. A lot of plants that come back immediately post fire, actually a lot of plants in general have some degree of nitrogen fixing ability. Another great one in this forest are alder, um, and we have those on the west side too. So um, yeah, a lot of plants out there can have the capacity to do that nitrogen fixing. Peas are a great example though, so that's why I brought that one up. We've got, yeah, fireweed in here too, yarrow, balsam root. If you want to nerd out about the plants that come back, I am down to do that because I love it. <laughs> but for now, I'm going to move on um, to our next stage of the successional process. And that's where I guess... Kevin, I just want to hop in here and let you know that it's 5.40 p.m. Great, so thanks another for Another five or 10 minutes, and then we're gonna move to Q&A. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so the next stage of our successional process basically is where shrubs start to overtop those forbs, those smaller flowers and things like that. Um, and we start to get some uh, other conifers in here too. So this is a picture taken from the Good Elk Creek fire. We see, that, we see that the shrubs are starting to come back here in the background. This is an alder um, that was re-sprouting, right? It's a sprouter. So it re-sprouted from that same root bowl, root bowl system. And it's really gotten big. It's only five years after this fire occurred. Um, here we've got some um, willow as well that's really making a, a resurgence. And this whole forest is pretty dominated at this point by the shrubs. Um, and we can see but in, it's like a game of I spy. We can see in here that there is actually some conifer um, regrowth. So there's some trees that are starting to establish themselves and starting to, to try to come back. Because the next stage here is where those conifers that in the Northwest especially will become the dominant um, plants in the forest and will become kind of characteristic of the forest. Um, those will eventually overtop our shrubs. So this next picture isn't great. I'm not sure that this area is in a successional um, stage after a fire, but you, you, there was some disturbance here at some point because all these trees are relatively small. So you've got this maple in the foreground um, that was able to grow pretty tall, maybe it resprouted from a root bowl, um, but you've also got these conifers that are starting to get bigger, are probably starting to overtop that maple and are, are starting to outcompete the maple a little bit. Eventually, you'll get to what we call a climax community, which we'll get to that term in just a moment. But a climax community is where you've got uh, much larger trees, um, more biodiversity, you've got um, structure in the forest where you've got maybe some standing dead snags in here. Um, you've got some trees that have fallen down. We've got a, a pretty rich um, habitat for animals and, um, and yeah, the, the, this is kind of, the end of that successional process. However, calling it a climax community, especially in places like the east side, is a little bit of a mis misnomer because on the east side, it, we're not hoping for every plant to be in the climax community stage. Remember on the east side, we're hoping for a mosaic of fire severity across the landscape. So we're hoping that there are some places in the forest that are in the early stages of succession and some places in the forest that are in later stages of succession. It's not like we want the entire forest to be a climax community all the time. That's not the goal. Okay, just briefly, I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between successional process on the east side versus the west side. The biggest difference here is time. Remember on the west side, we've got like a century, two centuries, three centuries before that forest is gonna be back to its climax community, um, before there's gonna be another fire. On the east side, you have much less time to, if you're a plant, to try to grow to a point where you're mature and can spread your seeds. 
There's one study of the Tianue Valley, um, which is a little further south in the Eastern Cascades in Washington, um, that there was a study that indicated um, fire came through about, like a large fire came through every 27 years. So if you're a plant, you need to get to the point where you are large enough to either survive that fire after 27 years or spread your seeds um, so that there will be more of you that are able to regrow after 27 years. The west side doesn't have to deal with that quite as much. So because of that, you have some different plants that come back west side versus east side. In the west side, you get a lot of your like bracken fern, huckleberry, um, red alder, those, those are those big alders. Um, yeah, and then things like willow and, uh, and fireweed and that kind of stuff that's pretty classic post-fire. East side, this is actually a different species of alder. Um, it's Sitka alder, on this, I think it's rubra now. But on the sinuata is what I learned it as. Anyway, a different species of alder that will grow back on the east side. Um, and then just some different species of shrubs in here too. I think this is some snowberry and some spirea is a great post-fire plant. Um, so because of that, that time difference in the, in the successional process, you have some slightly different species composition too. Okay, I think I might come back to this later just knowing what um, time we're at, but know that I, I may um, send these images out later. Basically, these are some pictures that we can use our observational skills on to try to identify what happened as a fire went through a landscape. This one's actually a trick. This one isn't fire. Um, there's a, a, a fungus actually, I don't remember the name of it right now, <laughs> but there is a fungus that comes through and actually hurts some of the trees, especially on the west side, um, that looks a little bit like a fire scar, but it's not. So it can be a little tricky. So if you see something like this, I encourage you to look at other trees around it and see if, it's a, if, if there's a common pattern. If there's a common pattern, then it's probably a fire scar. If not, I would look a little closer. It might actually be a fungus. Okay. Next, I wanna talk a bit about climate change. Um, so the, the primary article that I used to, to um, create this part of our slideshow is actually um, written by, hang on, let me get their name up here. <laughs> there we go. Um, Jessica Halofsky, um, and one of her co-authors was actually my advisor who I worked with, or, or my, um, my boss who I worked with at the Forest Service. So a lot of this I've learned from him as well. But in this paper, they, they basically compiled a lot of different scientific articles to create this paper. And part of that, um, they, they used 32 different models for how climate change might impact the Pacific Northwest. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of the mechanics behind climate change. If you want to go into that at a later time, I'm, I'm happy to do that with you. Um, but basically, we're going to focus in on what it means for the Pacific Northwest. According to these models, um, the majority of these models uh, indicate that this area will see an increase in mean annual temperature, an average annual, annual temperature. And this doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, like two degrees warmer all year long. This means that it, the summers are going to be a lot hotter. So the, the annual temperature increase, I think mid-century is about two degrees Celsius, late century is about four degrees Celsius, depending on our response to climate change and whether we can get our greenhouse gas emissions into check. Um, but in general, we're going to see an increase in temperature. We're already seeing that increase in temperature. And this is particularly going to happen in the summers, and it's particularly going to happen in extreme heat events. So it's not like it's two degrees warmer all year round. It's like we have two weeks in the summer where it's 100 degrees, which, if we think back to our fuels, has a lot of impact on um, the behavior of fire, right? We're not entirely sure what, it's gonna, what climate change will mean for precipitation in this area. It's really complicated. There's a lot of different things that go into play when you're thinking about precipitation. But most models agree that we'll see more extreme precipitation events. So bigger storms, um, bigger snowstorms, bigger rainstorms, and, and bigger drought events too. So what does that mean for fire? Basically, it means that um, our fire season is, is already lengthening. Um, there's a study that indicates that fire season has lengthened nine days a year since, 20, uh, tw since 2000, in the years between 2000 and 2015. So fire season's already lengthening, and um, it, you don't want to like point to one specific event or one specific year and say that that is evidence of climate change. But from my personal experience, as someone who grew up on the east side with fire, this 
like September fire season is never anything that I had to worry about. So I feel like I'm seeing the impacts of this too, which is um, making it real for me. <laughs> um, and most models also predict an increase in fire size and proportional fire severity too. So um, larger fires and within those fires, um, a proportionally larger size of high intensity areas too. There's a question about whether or not we'll be limited by fuels. California is actually limited by the fuels. So the fire season is kind of limited by, by yeah, the amount of fuel that's out there. We don't really think that's gonna be an issue in Washington, especially not on the west side. There's plenty of fuel on the west side of the Cascades. Um, but we think it will still be limited by the seasonality of the fire season. And part of the reason we don't really know what's gonna happen with fuels is because there's a possibility for fuel loading. So if you think about it, if we have a bunch more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, let's say it's a, a spring where there's a lot of water and it's you know great growing habitat, a lot of extra carbon dioxide for plants to produce sugars and plants start growing like crazy. And then in the summer it dries out, those fuels that all grew um, to be much larger in the spring are now in the, in the forest um, for summer fire season. So that's a possibility. We don't know if that's gonna happen, but that's a possibility that we have to consider. Another impact that climate change could have on fire in this area is an increased likelihood of reburns. So these images here, if we look at the, the one on the far right, this is um, the Domkey Lake Trail, um, which is near Lucerne on Lake Chelan, which is just south of the park. And this area was actually reburned. So it was burned in 2007, I believe, and then reburned in the Wolverine Fire in 2015. So this is an image, a uh, picture taken in, in 2016. And, um, when you have that reburn that came through, basically, if you're thinking about like plant adaptations, if you are an evader and you, um, you know, had a bunch of seeds in the seed bank and you started growing after a fire, and then, you know, what, what is that? Eight years later, a fire comes through and, and kills that biomass before it's able to produce more seeds, then that has a big impact on the, on the community. So that's why reburn is a big issue. On the west side, we think it will be uh, an, even, an even larger issue than on the east side, this reburning effect. Um, this picture is one that I took of the area around the Trail of the Cedars near New Halem that was burned in the Goodell Creek fire. So this area, this place where I'm standing taking this picture, burned five years ago. But you can see there's a lot of fuel. Um, some of it has fallen because of a result of trees dying in the fire. Um, but there's so much fuel here. And if this area was to reburn, it would burn very hot. Um, and it would probably kill a lot of those species that, were, that are trying to um, regrow right now at this point. So that increased likelihood of reburn, especially on the west side, is a really big issue um, when we're thinking about the effects of climate change in this area. And there's an increased um, increased likelihood of different stressors like drought. Drought on its own isn't going to kill a tree, but drought is going to make um, a tree, make the forest more susceptible to other impacts like fire or like a beetle um, attack or, or some sort of insect infection. So what does that mean for our plants? As we talked about a little bit, it's going to favor our resistor species. So our things like ponderosa pine, our things like Douglas fir, um, maybe some of our sprouters like maple, like alder. Um, but it's definitely not going to do any favors for, um, <laughs> for our, our evaders, the seeds that were just in the seed bank. Um, fire could mean that we have more chance of invasive species. It doesn't mean that we will have more invasive species, but um, we could see more invasive species. Things like cheatgrass here, especially on the east side. This is Stinky Bob on the west side that's invading an, an area after the Goodell Creek fire. We'll see less duff um, and forbs in the forest and more shrubs and grasslands probably, especially on the east side. We might see higher base canopies. So as a fire comes through, it might encourage trees to drop their lowermost branches. Um, and that actually has a big impact on the structure of the forest. So it has an impact on the, the animal species that can live there if our, if our base canopy of those trees is much higher. We might see a shift um, to homogeneity, so just like one species dominating in the forest, especially on the east side. If you've got um, cedars that can't survive after a fire, you might see a lot more just Douglas fir in that forest. On the east side, um, the southwest slopes, where it gets a lot more direct heat, a lot more direct sunshine, we might actually start seeing um, a converting of those slopes into grassland. So ponderosa pines, um, when they're growing, we, I, I talk about ponderosa pine recruitment, that basically means like the ability of a ponderosa pine to grow to a point where it's uh, producing seeds, right, to survive into adulthood of a tree. 
Um, and in order for ponderosa pines to survive as seedlings, they need a hot summer um, and they need some water. So we might start seeing mid-century that there's actually great um, ponderosa pine recruitment. But as we get later on in the century and it gets hotter and hotter, we might see less and less ponderosa pine recruitment, especially on southwest slopes. So those are some of the impacts of fire. Now I'm recognizing that it is um, 554 and I want to have some time for four questions here at the end. I'm willing to stick around a little longer if you are. <laughs> but I do want to spend just a moment. Oh man, I didn't talk about this. <laughs> All right, I want to spend a moment and just and, and address that there are some things that we're doing and we might need to do more of. These include things like reducing greenhouse gases, reducing um, fuels, especially on the east side, things like controlled burns, um, thinning and limbing. Creating defensible space around your house. I don't care if you live in the urban wildland interface or in town, like create defensible space around your home so that there's not a ladder fuel around your home and firefighters can get in and defend that if they need to. Maybe some assisted species migration. Um, this is something that's like a little bit hard. I, I, I'm not encouraging you to go out and just plant species. We need, we need to do it intentionally. But um, assisting species like redwoods in moving north is something that could help that species survive and could help our forest continue to survive too. Putting fire breaks in, using that fuel reduction treatment, collaborate and learning from each other. There are a lot of different land managers out there, a lot of smart people. Um, collaborate with indigenous people who've been doing this for a long time, right? Give those people or, or allow them to take back that control over their homelands and these forests that they have stewarded since time immemorial. Um, that is a great way that we could collaborate and learn from each other. Understand that we're going to need to adapt. Nobody has the right answer for this and we're going to have to um, be adapting on the fly. And educate. Let people know what's going on. We need to understand fire and have that healthy respect for fire and understand how it is both natural and um, a scary element of our ecosystem. And it's a, a, a a phenomenon that's changing as our climate changes and as the way that we use our landscape changes. This is my brother when he was 12, I think, really enjoying learning from me about fire ecology. He loved it. <laughs> this is around Stahican. <laughs> All right. I'm going to put these reflection questions up here. If you'd like to think about these reflection questions, I do encourage you to, to think about them. But I want to start opening it up for some question and answer, understanding that I ran a little over. I'm sorry, Evan. <laughs> that is OK, Mari. I think the wealth of information made it worth it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start the Q&A. So if you have any questions for Mari, go ahead and enter them in the chat box. And I will uh, relay those to her and she can answer those for you. Um, I'll get things started with a question that I had really briefly. Um, Mari, you used a few words that I'm not familiar with. Could you quickly go over what, is, what stand replacement means and what dehiss and what forbs are? <laughs> Yes, thank you Evan, for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Stand replacing is basically where um, the, the current trees, and especially trees when we're talking about a forest because those kind of characterize the forest. Um, the current trees die and a, a new um, set of species moves in or, or maybe it's the same trees that re, the same species that regrow, but basically we're replacing all of the trees that were living there. Um, dehiss <laughs> is the word that we use for like at the end of the season a plant loses its leaves or um, a small flower or something forb <laughs> we'll talk about that um, loses its leaves and those die and decompose and become part of the soil um, a forb is actually just like any like small flowering plant that's not a grass um, yeah so like lots of flowers we refer to as forbs Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, we're getting some questions from our lovely participants. The first question comes from Jen Siva, and the question is, is yarrow a nitrogen fixing plant? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know yarrow to be a nitrogen fixer. Um, it might have some capability to, to do nitrogen fixing, but I don't know it as a nitrogen fixing plant. I'd have to look that up and get back to you. Okay, and we can facilitate that. Mari can spend some time looking that up and get that answer, not just to Jen, but I think to the rest of the group. Um, I'll make a note of it. 
yeah, I do know a good article for that. Cool. Next question is from Susan Skillman. How would you respond if given the opportunity to the US president when he says the West Coast states just need to clean up their forest floors to avoid fire? In other words, what is your elevator speech for climate change resistant politicians? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, because, you know, fuel reduction is part of the equation. It's something that we do need to do now um, because of the decades of fire suppression and because even to this day, we're still suppressing fire. We don't want fire to burn into a town or burn into a place where we have um, economic interest. So, that is part of the equation, um, but what we're seeing now, you know, <laughs> man, I wish I had an elevator speech for this. <laughs> um, what we're seeing now is, is more than that. Um, what we're seeing now is more than just the fuel load being larger. We're seeing that fuel load dry out. We're seeing our fire season get longer, um, and there's evidence linking that to a changing climate. So to hotter, drier summers. Um, and <laughs> that's a great question. I should probably work on my elevator speech for that. Um, I would be curious if anyone in this group has a better elevator speech than that. <laughs> Thanks for the answer. And I will specify that Jen, or sorry, Susan said, um, that states just need to clean up their forest floors. But what I'm hearing from you is that, yeah, cleaning up some of the excess fuels would help. In addition to that, we probably need to make a lot of systemic and economic changes to accompany that cleanup. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Murray. Next question from Jasmine Villar. What type of plant adaptations to fire exist in the Scabland, Great Basin, Sagebrush region east of the Cascades? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't spent a whole lot of time studying that area, but from my understanding of fire, um, a fire behavior in a place like that is going to, um, fires are, are not gonna burn quite as hot because you don't have all the fuel buildup that you do in a forested area. So you might not get some of the issues of um, like really intensely burned areas where you have, um, like nutrients leaving soil and things like that, you're probably going to have plant adaptations that are more um, your um, your evaders, right? Your plants that are just putting seeds into the seed bank. That's what I imagine most plants would have in that area because they don't have to worry as much about the fire getting so hot that it kills the seeds in the seed bank. Um, that's my educated guess, my hypothesis about that. Awesome. Thank you. And a follow-up from Susan Skillman, she says, thanks, Mari, you, you'll do well in the elevator. <laughs> Eventually. Um, it is 6.02 p.m. I'm going to ask one more question and then relay a little bit more information from um, Molly, our education manager, who's here. Do you do any outreach to communities? Oh, actually, let me back up. From Laura, can you speak to the role of fire in Camas Meadows? Totally. This is something that I did want to talk about a little more. Um, but kind of ran out of time. But yeah, fire has been used as a tool for indigenous people in this area for a very long time to encourage the growth of things like camas. So um, camas is a plant that, you know, most of my research has been on the east side where there's not as much camas. So I don't know the exact um, like physiology behind how that works, but camas is basically encouraged to grow by fire. Um, and camas is a really important food um, and medicine for indigenous people, especially on the west side of the Cascades here. So fire has been a tool that's been used for to encourage the growth of camas, as well as other things like bracken fern, um, like huckleberry, which is an important um, food and medicinal resource for indigenous folks too. And as we've suppressed fire more and more and not allowed the, the use of fire as a management tool, um, camas especially has become rarer and rarer in these fields. So um, we're starting to see a, a shift in species in a lot of those meadows because of the way that we are suppressing fire. Um, Laura, does that speak to that sufficiently? We'll await her chat reply in the chat box. Um, a question from Franz Amador. Laura says, thank you, by the way. Franz Amador 
asks, do you do any outreach to communities to help them accept controlled burns? I read there's a lot of resistance to them. Um, do I personally? Well, this is part of my personal effort <laughs> to, to educate. Um, and I know that a lot of organizations do this. Um, but North Cascades Institute, we haven't done a lot of this um, per se. We, we do a lot of environmental education. Um, and especially after the Good Owl Creek fire, we, we do include more about fire ecology in, in what we teach. Um, and I, I want to also acknowledge that controlled burns do have impacts. Um, my family has some property where um, several of the structures were burned in a controlled burn that got out of control. So they do have impacts on a community and that's, that's like apart from the smoke um, and, and impacts like that that they have to communities. So I want to acknowledge that they do have impacts on communities and they're also important for the health of the forest and for the long-term survival of that community. So again, it's, it's one of those like mixed bag issues that um, does require some education so that everyone understands why it's necessary um, and has maybe a voice in how that's done or when that's done, I don't know. Including the community in that process is pretty important. Thank you, Mari. And just a bit of supplementary information on Yarrow um, from Molly Harrigan, our education manager. She says, Yarrow is rich in potassium and phosphorus, not nitrogen. However, it does attract a type of nitrogen fixing bacteria called azotobacter. When the Yarrow falls, you will have this bacteria in the soil in greater amounts. So we can imagine that that bacteria will do some nitrogen fixing. Thank you to Molly. And thank you everybody for your time and your attention at Fire and Flowers, a story of resilience by Mari Schramm. Getting some thanks and some accolades in the chat. Um, before we split, I want to offer our lovely participants an opportunity to give us a little bit of feedback in the form of a Zoom poll. So I'll put up a poll much like the one you saw earlier. Um, and it has just a few questions for you. If you're gracious enough to um, leave some uh, responses to those, we'd appreciate it. Um, that poll should be available to you now. And while you're filling that poll out, I would like to put it on your, put it on your calendars that we have some more programs coming up very soon. In fact, as soon as September 29th. On the 29th, we'll have a program called Observe and Imagine, connecting to place through the creative process. And that is actually an interactive program, um, an art-based program with Karina Del Rosario, uh, where you will end the program with um, an art, a piece of art that you've created. Um, she focuses on something called ekphrastic writing, which is writing based on the experience of being in a place. Um, so very, very, very interesting, very intellectually stimulating. And October 7th, the the very, very popular Molly Hashimoto will be leading uh, Autumn Watercolors with us. And you'll get to see her studio space. You'll get to hear a little bit about how she works. And then she'll actually help people with a few specific um, sort of motifs that we see in the Pacific Northwest in the Cascades um, and painting those. So if you want to approach that course actively, you can come with some sketches and some um, watercolor that you're working on or you can just sit back and enjoy observing the creative process. On October 15th, we welcome back Gina Roberti, who actually graduated from the Western Washington uh, Environmental Education Program and did her residency with us. And she currently works at Mount St. Helens Institute. And she's going to talk all about volcanoes. Her program is Living with Volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. So that promises to be a very hot class. I encourage you to check out our website and cascades.org. And also do check your emails. Um, we are going to send out the recording of this video. Um, and I think Mari has at least one question to follow up on. So there'll be some more information um, about the wildfires that Molly, Mari shared tonight to come with you. So do keep track of those emails. And it looks like 100% of you have voted in the poll. So thank you very much for your feedback. Thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at an NCI program. Thanks, everybody.